Recently, I asked you folks what your favorite DLC from Fallout 4 is, and to nobody's surprise, Far Harbor won out. After more than 8,000 votes, which, by the way, you people are awesome, Nuka World only accounted for 14% of the overall vote. I can't really say I'm surprised, and while I still get a kick out of raidering it up in Nuka World, I admit it has a lot of room for improvement. So continuing on a somewhat long tradition here at Grey Gaming of thinking up ways that Todd Howard fell just short of excellence, I'm at it once again and bringing you five easy things Bethesda probably could have done to fix the Nuka World DLC in Fallout 4. So settle into your abandoned spaceship and try not to sit in that spilled Nuka grape. At least you hope that spilled Nuka grape as we dive right in with number one. I have a theory. It's a crackpot theory, but I have a liberal arts degree, so I'm basically the smartest person you've ever met, and you should let me finish. My theory about why so many people hate the story of Nuka World is because you start out on pretty shaky footing with Harvey. Harvey is the wounded dude on the floor of the Nuka World Transit Center that sends us to Nuka World to help his family. But let's face it, guys, anyone starting this quest is very likely to have high enough charisma by this point in their gameplay to suss out of him that he's a slave whose job is to send people into the gauntlet a deathsport type maze that culminates in a rigged cage match with Overboss Coulter, the head honcho in charge of three distinct raider gangs occupying Nuka World. We know it's a trap, so our options are, don't go, in which case way to drop money on a perfectly good DLC for 10 minutes of gameplay, or, you know, do the stupid thing and go anyway so you can actually start the DLC proper. I probably don't have to tell you that this is a really bad premise to start you off, and this rough start basically begs players to pick apart the rest of the story, which while not great probably isn't as bad as some people claim. But since we're now actively looking for reasons to not have fun, the story gets run through the commentary ringer. So a simple fix here is to replace Harvey with a gunner. Let me, let me set the stage for you here. The exterior of the transit center is occupied by gunners under the command of Commander Kalor. Gunners really shouldn't mix Navy and Army rank structures. Anyway, regardless, the gauntlet is also the final resting ground of several gunners that were sent as a scouting party. It's a little more complicated than that, but for the purpose of this video we'll call it a scouting party. So why not have the guy bleeding out on the floor be a gunner who was part of said mission, who was wounded in the gauntlet and is actually bleeding out? He can tell you that now he's probably considered a deserter and Kalor will have him killed if she finds him. You can tell him Kalor's unit is dead and the coast is clear. He'll say he's dying and you can take the paragon action of giving him a stim pack, which he'll actually accept and use, or you can let him die. If he lives, he can tell you the route to Nuka World is a death trap, a risk you've faced many times in the Commonwealth before, so you have plenty of reason to be arrogant and head on anyway, despite the warnings, without knowledge of what you're actually getting into. Since he never made it through the gauntlet, he doesn't have much info other than it's the most terrifying experience of his life, it's extremely dangerous, and no amount of pain or torture could get him to go back. It's still not the cleanest introduction, and if you're a regular on the channel, you probably know I am usually the last one to suggest adding more gunners to Fallout 4, but in this case, I think it creates a much stronger opening than, I work for a bunch of raiders and they're waiting to ambush anyone that comes into Nuka World. You should go anyway. I've said it before on this channel, and I'm sticking to my story, but I swear on my first playthrough of Nuka World, I accomplished a single gang ending for Nuka World. Both the Disciples and Pack took off, leaving me in sole control of the operators. You know, besides Mags, Willie, and Lizzie. But I have very vivid memories of this happening. Maybe someone tracked me down over a platinum chip and I'm missing some gray matter. <laughs> Get it? Gray matter? Oh, you're no fun. But on my most recent playthrough, I went out of my way to burn bridges with two out of the three gangs. No radiant quests completed, no parks were awarded, and no outposts in the Commonwealth were given. And I still ended up with two loyal gangs at the end of the DLC. What I'm trying to say is that here in 2023, a single gang ending does not appear to actually be an option. Whether I'm the unwitting observer of the Mandela effect or Bethesda just chose to patch it out, because why wouldn't you patch out a far superior? ending. Here's the deal. The pack, operators, and disciples are all very different culturally, ideologically, and sartorially. There's just not a lot of common ground with any of them. So the fact that you're only able to eliminate one gang means that when all is said and done, there is still going to be one gang that doesn't fit your current playstyle. You can't be a bloodthirsty monster who derives pleasure and meaning from other people's misery while also exercising restraint whenever the payoff demands. The ability to eliminate two of the Endeb Raider gangs 
things actually would go a long way toward improving the cohesion of player headcanon and role-playing. Picture this, the sole survivor conquers the gauntlet and is given the choice to become overboss or get raidered to death. As they tour Nuka Town, USA, they discovered that the raiders here are powerful. None of the factions in the Commonwealth are strong enough to defeat all three of them, at least not without joining forces, and we all know the likelihood of that happening, don't we? So you hatch a scheme. By favoring one gang overwhelmingly over the others, you increase their prestige, they gain resources and manpower, and when the other gangs have had enough, the one you've backed is now powerful enough to take them on single-handedly. But they suffer terrible casualties in the process, and when the smoke settles, they are now spread all over the Commonwealth and throughout the Brad Burton region. Now when they are at their most complacent and vulnerable, you strike. You take out their leadership before they even know they're under attack. You clear Nuka Town, USA, set the traitors free, then you clear the rest of the park. Finally, you return to the Commonwealth and wipe out the last vestiges of raider scum who don't even know they're under siege yet. It's so perfectly suited to the main theme of Fallout 4. The Minutemen want to make the Commonwealth safer from raiders. The Railroad want to end slavery. Although Fallout 4 depicts them very one-dimensionally interested in synths, it is stated in Fallout 3 that they do care about human slaves too. The Brotherhood naturally would have reason to despise the raiders for preying on the weak, and the Institute may just find that the raiders are growing too powerful and wish to pacify them the same way they did with the Commonwealth Provisional Government. Of course, if you do wish to keep playing as a raider, you now have total control over the most uncontestedly powerful raider gang in the region and can keep waging war on anyone that tickles your fancy. The end result here is just so much better than what we were left with and has me seriously wondering why we weren't left with this option in the first place. Okay, I know where Bethesda's heart was on this one, but the execution of Open Season is so haphazard and nonsensical, it may as well feature in my theories and lore playlist. It kind of feels like when you tell a teenager to take the trash out and they give a bunch of attitude before doing it, and the next time you walk out the door, you trip over the bag that was just left on the back steps. Not, not speaking from experience or anything here. Wait, what the hell was I even talking about? Oh yeah, Open Season. It's made available to you the first time you visit the end up market and speak to the dock. You might be forgiven for thinking this would be like anything else in Fallout 4, very little consequence, but alas, it will lock you out of any remaining quest line if you undertake it. Also, Gage dies as a result of undertaking it, so if you aren't particularly thrilled with having to gun down one of the best followers in the entire game, well, Open Season doesn't give you a choice. So how do we fix Open Season? Well, the first and easiest fix is to refine the two separate triggers for this quest. The first one we already talked about, which is to talk to the doc, but instead of getting the dialogue to start Open Season as soon as you become come over boss, have her wait until after power play. She could say that she has been waiting to see what sort of person you were and after you wiped out the disloyal gang, it shows that you were strong enough to take on the other gangs and that you've proven that you were intolerant of raiders acting out of self-interest. Maybe the sole survivor can respond that they had never thought of it that way, or they could say that they've been plotting the gang's downfall all along. Or you can rebuke her and keep on raiding. Player's choice. The second trigger, which I haven't talked about yet, is when you kill any rando end up raider. If you do this, then the quest starts automatically, which is really crappy if you're playing on survival difficulty and accidentally tag some rando by mistake. So a better option if you do kill a raider that's inconsequential is to scare the dookie out of you with one of these. Stop right there, criminal scum! Then you're given some Skyrim-esque choices. Pay restitution, perform a task for that gang as penance, speech check that you're the overboss and they were a dirty scab who deserved to die, or go open season on them. But properly triggering open season doesn't even come close to overhauling this quest. Three very well-known issues arise at the end of open season. There's a very well-known bug that after finishing open season, all of the end of traders, um, they go bodacious. This is due to a bug that causes them to unequip their entire inventory when removing their slave collars. It should be a very simple fix to correct that, even though Todd never even tried. For PC players who aren't afraid of the all-powerful console command, you can correct this. I personally like to dress them up in the western outfits from Dry Rock Gulch myself, but it's still something that shouldn't even be an issue in the first place. As much as I personally detest all the people that like to use my videos as an excuse to complain about lazy Bethesda, I will say in this case it seems 
seems like they kind of deserve it. Another major problem is that Preston Garvey never forgives you for turning Raider and offers no chance of you explaining your actions. Completing Open Season does nothing to regain some of his lost trust. It just permanently breaks his utility as a companion, his story as an in-game character, and because he's so curt and flippant with you, you really miss out on a lot of side content if you try to move forward with the Minutemen storyline. Bethesda thought far enough ahead to retcon in some dialogue in the Museum of Freedom. If for some reason players decide to wait to complete When Freedom Calls until after completing Nuka World, then Preston actually gives you the benefit of the doubt that you're trying to turn away from your Raider past. So why is he so forgiving at the start of the game, but not mid, late, or post gameplay? The one issue from Open Season that grinds my gears the most is that Porter Gage sides with the Raiders. Regardless of his affinity for the player, regardless of his lifetime of juggling Raider politics and his history of learning when to stand and fight and when to kick brick, Gage just says, yep, I'm going to side against the single most influential and terrifying Raider boss he's ever seen. This one is unforgivable on Bethesda's part. Gage should have been given dialogue before attacking the sole survivor, demanding an explanation and allowing them to de-escalate the situation. You can choose to spare his life and let him wander off into the waste, or kill him if you can't convince him to change allegiance. If you pass some speech checks, you can convince him to keep following you and even turn his back on being a Raider, and finally try to make a positive change in this world. This could have actually been a bittersweet resolution to Gage's storyline. Either you fail to convince him, and so your options are to kill him or let him go forever, or you can try to redeem him, or at the very least, let him keep following you while he looks for something better. There are other problems with Open Season, but they're minor enough that it's probably not worth spending much time trying to iron out most of them. But these are the biggest improvements that I think could really have cemented it as an appropriate conclusion to the Nuka World storyline. Admittedly, it's pretty easy to botch a questline like Open Season, but one thing that's pretty hard to get wrong is taking point blank aim at the like button. Viewer engagement is a metric we use to determine the sort of content that provides the most value to you, a random person on the internet who has the power to determine if I can afford a new dust cover for my handmade rifle this month. Please, thank you, and now on with the video. Say what you will about Nuka World, but they went all out with new creatures. Granted, I don't think they tried as hard with Nuka World critters as the ones from Far Harbor, with most of them being reskinned critters that already existed. Gator Claws, well, obviously Death Claws, Brahma Luffs are just Brahmin, Gazelles just Rad Stags, Blood Worms or Mole Rats, you get the picture. Now, I'm not complaining about the reskinning. At the end of the day, it still adds variety to the mix. My main issue is that due to location reset or lack thereof, after you've cleared the parks, these creatures become rare to non-existent. It would be nice to be able to reliably hunt the various Nuka World creatures, but the few locations they can be encountered are few and predictable. There are always a couple specific parking lots that have gazelles and bromeluff. There's a spot southeast of Nuka World Red Rocket that always has crickets, there's an ant hill between Nuka World Junkyard and the Hibologist Camp, and Gator Claws and Nuka Lurks go extinct as a result of your actions. That's pretty much it. It would have been nice to have a few more options for hunting the new creatures they added in this DLC. They could have integrated the Wasteland Workshop DLC to include traps suited for Nuka World critters, allowing you to attract them to settlements, at least to the Nuka World Red Rocket, and do whatever your heart desires. Set up a brand new zoological park, the N-Dub Red Rocket is certainly big enough for that one, or you could set up an arena and pit the creatures against each other, or against raiders, or even yourself, or you could just set up a beta wave emitter and have scary critters at your beck and call. Having someone like Lizzie from the operators reverse engineer the Nuka World Replicator so you can crank out new Gator Claws but with some operator behavioral controls in place would have been a nice touch. Even just setting up a few new random encounters with the Beasties, one that doesn't involve a Death Claw surrounded by dead pack raiders. Seriously, that random encounter gets real old real fast. Anyway, random encounters with the various Beasties would go a long way toward making it feel like 1. There's actually life outside the park instead of a desolate waste, and 2. Like there's actually something to be seen and experienced here after the fireworks show concludes. Foods. Situated on the southern edge of the Bradburton region is Evan's home, a camper suspended on timbers. There's not much of note here, with the only occupant being the homeowner, Jerry. Okay, it's obviously Evan. A strange thing about Evan's home is that he lets you have access to anything you want from his home. There's quite a bit to be had, clean water, oil, fertilizer, adhesive items, and the area respawns very quickly, so you can come back again and again to restock on these things. The story of Evan is fairly well documented, but not a lot of people actually know it. 
Seven, as it turns out, is a tribute to a real-life fan who Bethesda had planned to send a care package of Fallout swag to. However, Evan unfortunately passed away before he could receive it, so as a means of immortalizing him forever, Bethesda added Evan to Nuka World, a helpful, friendly NPC who would give you anything he owned if you asked. It's actually surprisingly heartfelt, and I am withdrawing one of my Todd Howard bashes from earlier in light of this act of respect. They even made him unkillable to thwart those players who would happily gun him down and post to Tic Tac for the Edgelord prestige. But with all that said, Evan's home is just a pit stop in the middle of nowhere. There's pretty much nothing in the surrounding area worth visiting, so players don't really have a need to be in the vicinity of Evan's home in the first place, and eventually it comes down to something that you just fast travel to on your way through the park, loot completely within 30 seconds without acknowledging Evan's presence, and take off again. What started as a genuine tribute to a deceased fan is just sort of lost to the grind of Fallout 4. I think there could have been two fairly easy solutions to this problem. One could be to incorporate a Hearthstone-style settlement centered around Evan's home. Evan could ask for the Soul Survivor's help in setting up a place that is more inviting to others and better able to assist people in their struggles. He could send the Soul Survivor to the Nuka World Market to purchase the various supplies he needs to expand his homestead and include things like guest quarters, Brahmin stables, a clinic, a restaurant, and community garden. Along the way, he has to build a fence to keep the critters out and hire guards to fend off human predators. All the while, Evan continues to live in his little camper, content with what he has, showing that he's not just trying to prop himself up as the ruler of his own tiny world, but is truly concerned with the struggles of others. The other option, which is much easier and I personally would much rather go for, would be to simply make Evan's home a workshop location and allow you personally to build all of the previously mentioned items and objects at his request. I only mention Hearthstone due to the number of negative comments I get saying people preferred that mess of a settlement building mechanic from Skyrim over the infinitely better one that we got in Fallout 4, but I do get it. If your primary goal is to keep on questing, I kind of like the Elder Scrolls method of buy empty home, then buy enhancements, then enjoy lavish new home. It has its place, I just don't necessarily think Fallout 4 would have been better with that instead of the workshop. Anyway, soapbox speech over. I feel that either styles of this small quest would have made Evan much more memorable and constitutes a much higher level of dedication and expectation that all players should have to interact with this tribute if they want the full Nuka World experience, much more so than a lone, unkillable, non-quest related NPC sitting atop a tiny inconsequential camper in the middle of nowhere. These are just my personal picks, and honestly, they aren't even my favorite methods of improving the Nuka World DLC, but two of my personal favorites have already been mentioned in my 5 easy ways to improve the Minutemen, and my third 5 sites that should have been settlements videos, and I'm trying my darndest not to double dip on content for these sorts of videos. I'm curious if any of these changes would have been enough for you to change how you personally rank the DLC in Fallout 4. Let your voice be heard, in a manner of speaking, in the comments below. Until next time, stay safe and may the force be with you. Wait, wrong channel. Um, and we hope to see you here next time on Grey Gaming.